And we won't probably deal with that so much, but we'll get to it maybe next time. All right? All right. 2 Corinthians 10. And it says at verse 12, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Isn't that an interesting verse? A very interesting verse. And then in uh, Psalm 139 and verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. <coughs> a group of U.S. senators wanted to get an assessment of potentialities in a theater of war. And the commanding general said, It's hard from this distance to understand the real granularity of what's going on. That's what we'll be talking about. He was saying that to really appreciate any given situation, you have to get close up to it. And it's that way in our lives. It's that way in others uh, uh, around us. For us, it means that if you really want to see what is happening, what has happened, and what may happen, situations have to be broken down into granular form. We have some difficult decisions that I'll have to make in the next uh, week or so regarding the school. And a lot, when you're talking about families and children and parents and so forth, you really have to take a granular look at each one of those situations. And sometimes that's a little bit scary to take a very close look and to see what is really going on. We risk a lot by looking at things only in the general sense because you really don't get a good view of what's taking place, and you certainly don't want that when we come together like this for the Holy Spirit to only look at you in the general sense. You want it much more personal than that. Aren't you glad that salvation is not a just a general program? That it's very personal, isn't it? The aspect of salvation is Christ sacrificing himself for you. And that's how you have to look at it. That's at the granular approach. So he looks at each one of us, and he sees all of the things that are there and all of the things that we're struggling with, and he still values us, and he still loves us. First, if we take a look at things in too great a general a sense of things, we risk miss, uh, missing great opportunities for personal, personal growth and for improvement. We might also miss spotting small problems before they become large ones if we take too general approach to life. We tend to avoid the tendency to make a more aggregate or a mass look at the function of our lives. As a matter of fact, that is not a, uh, a practical approach in any sense. Uh, Christianity has become a very general word, isn't it? And it doesn't have a whole lot of application for many people in the particular sense. And yet that is the only way that it can be applied is in the particular or the granular approach. No one lives 24 hours in a chunk. You live moment by moment. You don't wake up and in the next moment you say, well, that was a good 24 hours. You live moment by moment, and each moment is a decision that will determine how the next moment goes and what will be done. So what you're receiving right now of the Holy Spirit as he speaks to your heart and your mind will determine how it will go for you in the future. It will determine how you see things in your past. Do you see them as failures? Or do you see where Christ has come and has turned all of that around and given you a much higher and a better perspective, and you can see how all of those things play into your life right now? The greater the granularity, the more flexible a system is. You've heard me say before that Christ came to simplify matters for us, but the way that he did that was to break things down to their simplest form. And he's still doing that for us today, not by causing us to overlook important and sometimes hard-to-spot issues. You'll never hear the Holy Spirit come alongside you and say, well, there's a couple of things going on in your life that are holding you back. Just, we'll overlook that. No, what we do is we zero in on that, and that's what he will do. And that tells us where we are with God. Are we truly walking with him? And the scripture is very good for that. A really good example of granularity and what it means might come through the uh, satellite pictures that you can see. It's, a, it's pretty amazing when you think of how much you can magnify down and see a not just a particular city or a particular street, but a particular house and a particular driveway and get a front, back, and side view of just about everything. 
If we can employ granularity in our lives, solutions will come much more easily because we'll see how they apply much more easily than God just giving us a general sense. It's kind of like in the ministry of prophecy. Have you ever noticed very often when people are operating in that ministry, not that office, but in that ministry, that the things that are brought forth to be uh, said from God to an individual are very general. Very general. God has a plan for your life. Well, that could be said of anybody. That's a very general prophecy. And I'm not minimizing that, but usually when a prophecy is given in the sense of God giving it to an individual, there'll be some particulars that are stated. So granularity comes into play there, the particulars of a situation. If we don't take this approach, we will quickly become besieged with problems, questions and factors which will limit us in our potential for Christ, and they have the very great potential of overwhelming us. This is sometimes why people don't want to come to a full gospel church. Got to get particular. Got to get granular. And that's not me. That's what the Holy Spirit does. When the Word is opened up, he gets into particulars, and he gets into the very grains of your life. And that makes some people uncomfortable because he's pinpointing, as only the Holy Spirit can, he's pinpointing where there are potential problem spots. And he's doing that as out of grace and mercy. He's not doing it to be mean or to make you feel uncomfortable, although sometimes it might be warranted. But what he's doing is he's saying, here's some problem areas. Let's work on them and we'll get them resolved. God designed us piece by piece, right? So he knows our capabilities. And he knows our potentialities and even potential problems. If you want to know, really know, the shape that your vehicle is in, wash it every now and then. So we're talking about the body of it. You know, it's, uh, it's amazing. We had the van washed here not long ago, and I was looking at it from a distance like, man, that looks like a new vehicle. I mean, it was looking good. But then I get up close, and I see what 15 years of driving everywhere has done to that vehicle. All kinds of nicks and scrapes and cuts here and there. You get uh, up close to it and you find a little bit of a different story. When we have been washed by the blood of the Lamb, a few nicks and cuts from the previous life might still exist. That's not to say that we haven't been completely and absolutely forgiven. We have been. But what put them there, like bad behavior, is forgiven. The Holy Spirit comes to us and says, let's work on the rest there's any lingering effect or impact, because in this one sense, there, there very well may be. Let's say that you've uh, done, some, done something illegal, and now you're going to pay the price for it. Can God forgive you for that? Of course he can. And will he forgive you instantaneously? Of course he will. And you'll still have the repercussions from whatever you did. And don't try to disassociate, well, I would never do anything illegal. Well, the, the truest sense of what is appropriate or inappropriate is God's word. And sometimes we get ourselves involved in things that have repercussions. And we may say, all right, I know that was inappropriate. I know that was wrong. That's not uh, consistent with God's word. God, forgive me. And if we ask that sincerely and repent of that, he'll say, you're forgiven. And you still may have to deal with some of the repercussions from that. The writer of the psalm never really refers to his own ability to assess every part of who he is in these verses that we read in Psalm 139. But he calls on God, the one that designed him, to take a granular approach toward examining him. Look what it says in verse 16 in Psalm 139. It says, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Isn't that an interesting verse? Very interesting verse. It says that God knows who you are, and there's no sense in trying to play games with him and trying to uh, think that you can fool that he uh, fool him in knowing who you are. He does know. He formed you uh, and knew all of your parts, if you will, before you were actually all put together. So he had a plan for your life, and he knows you at that granular level. And we need to acknowledge that and say, God, you know who I am. Do you think that God knows you better than you know yourself? Of course. Absolutely. Most people are just fooling themselves. They don't need the devil to deceive them. They're deceiving themselves about who they are and what they can do and what their potentialities are. And so we have to rely on not our own wit and emotion 
to sort all that out, we have to say, Holy Spirit, you got to help me on this. You got to help me sort all of this out so I can see what needs to be done, what uh, needs to be put aside, what needs to be added in. You see, the more granular something is, like I said, as stated, uh, the more flexible it is. We were designed to be flexible to every situation without losing the greater good. And you have to do that with people, don't you? Or you're going to be upset all the time. You got to be flexible in those relationships without losing the sense of the greater good that is stated clearly in God's word. Can you do that? Can you be in, let's say, have a association with someone? I'm not going to use the word friendship because that's a kind of a different subject. But can you have an association with someone that is very diverse in their outlook and what they believe? Maybe they don't believe in God at all. Maybe they're leading a life that the Bible describes as an abomination. Can you have a association with them that is not adversarial because of that or due to that factor? You can, to a point. But I can tell you that sooner or later, the further you walk with somebody, the more it's going to become apparent, hopefully, if you're a believer, it will be, that you can't walk very far with somebody like that. Because you can't walk together with somebody unless you are agreed right? And sooner or later, that disparity in agreement or lifestyle is going to make itself very, very apparent one way or the other. Sometimes it's very clear in a hurry, isn't it? And sometimes you get that discernment from the Holy Spirit, and really that's kind of the Holy Spirit helping you to tap in at the granular approach when you're talking to somebody or you're meeting with somebody. God wants us to take a microscopic look at who we are, and what we want so that we can get better formulated to a better strategy. So he wants us to take a close look. People stall out in their growth for Christ when they fail to take a granular approach to self-examination. So we have to get meticulous in that self-examination and not overlook things and not say, oh, I'm thankful for God's grace because I've got this thing in my life and I'm not going to do anything about it. You do know if, if you take that approach, you've just stepped out of God's grace. You're no longer covered by that. When he points something out to you by his mercy and his grace, this needs to change in your life, your attitude, this practice, whatever the case it is. And then you say, oh, I'm not going to do that, and I'm still going to be a believer. See, then you're taking the general sense, not the granular approach of what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. You might be able to understand someone... Uh, not wanting to see themselves that clearly. I'd be surprised if uh, the clearer look of yourself didn't startle you quite a bit, especially if the Holy Spirit comes alongside and says, let me point something out to you that you missed in this self-examination. The good thing is that such, uh, such an examination is not done alone. And we're not engaging in such an examination. We're not saying, Holy Spirit, come alongside and look on this, and then we're waiting to sustain a blow that he's about to level on us. He doesn't do that. He comes alongside and he says, you know, this situation can get better right now. And the, the advantage of the granular approach is that it can be, get better grain by grain, step by step, something that we're all capable of engaging, so it's not so overwhelming. It is done with a, that type of examination, done with a loving God that will walk us through that examination on the way to something better, a better way of living. We need to do a, I know some of you, uh, maybe all of you have gone through MRIs, and uh, that's kind of a interesting process. If you haven't gone through one, I've gone through several. Sometime back, I was having an increasing number of migraines, and uh, so my doctor said, uh, we'll do an MRI, see what uh, what's going on there. And so they uh, inserted me into the tube, and, uh, you know, at that, uh, they may be doing it differently now, I don't know, but at that time, it was like, the hardest part was don't move. Don't move while all the noise is going on. And I'm thinking, well, I'll just sleep my way through all of this. That's almost impossible. But uh, I'm not claustrophobic, but it took a tremendous amount of self-discipline to stay in there and not go into a minor panic because of what was going on. And the only way that I did, you know what it really was, uh, the hardest part of the, the discipline was don't open your eyes. Just stay there, stay still, don't open your eyes. 
and I managed to get through uh, all of that. And I'm telling myself, now, you've you got enough discipline to do that, so do it. Months went by after that examination. I didn't hear anything. And uh, kind of typical. Finally, I had a annual checkup months later. And the doctor just in passing asked me, did you get your results from this? Did you see the results from this? And I said, well, no, I didn't. Nobody called me or sent me a report or whatever. And uh, if I had called, the doctor would have told me everything looks normal. And that would have been that. When I was in the doctor's office for that annual checkup, I was amazed at how, because he brought that up on the screen, and how detailed that report was. He went over it with me at length, detail by detail. And that's the type of examination that you and I must seek from God, as is described in Psalm 139. That's what we want. We don't want God to take a general look at us. He loves us too much for that. You know, my... Dad was an extremely wise man. He was a quiet man, and he knew me very well. And this was relayed to me by my mother many, many years later. I was getting into some uh, different questionable relationships, and my mother was saying, you need to talk to him. She told my dad. She said, you need to talk to him. And he said, that's not the right approach with him. Let's Let's uh, keep on praying for him and trust that God's going to lead him through all of that. And he did. But it was their prayer and their trust in God and my dad's understanding of the type of person that I am that said, let's wait. Let's not get into this in a confrontational situation. He knew me. And it's, I've shared this with you before. I can't remember one time he was ever wrong. I'm sure he must have been somewhere. But looking back on it, it's like, wow, he got it right every single time. But see, that's what God wants to do for us. He looks at each one of us, and he knows the approach that is best for each one of us. And he can approach us in those different ways without ever compromising who he is and without ever compromising his word in any way, shape, or form. And that's what a lot of people want God to do. Well, God, can't you kind of ease up on that requirement a little bit. You know, that holiness thing. You know, I can, I can be a, a follower of, of your son. I can be a follower of Christ. You know, if I don't have to get so much into that, let me give you some uh, really big boo words for a lot of people that aren't leading a life. Holiness. Sanctification. Consecration. Repentance. Dedication. Uh oh here comes the big bad one. Commitment. Oh, that scares a lot of people. Get some shaking in their shoes when those types of words come up, and we're not capable of any of those things, except for the Holy Spirit, except for the example of Christ. So it's a two-bit excuse to say, I can't do those things. Of course you can't. Nobody can. That's why we have a, quite a team on our side called the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all those around us that are leading the life that are there to Help us, right? We need to do that examination uh, from time to time. It's the type of examination that is only going to benefit us. You know, do that type of self-examination, but then really get bold in the Lord and say, God, would you double-check my work? You know, I just looked at my life, and, yeah, there's a trouble spot over here. I'm doing fairly well over here. He may come alongside and say, no, there's more than one trouble spot over here, and you're really not doing so well over here. But then he doesn't leave. Then he says, now I'm going to empower you so that you can do better and uh, do what you need to do to lead the type of life that's going to bring you the success that you want. He's the one that can refute or confirm how honest we have been in the examination. You ever think about that? You know, people think pretty highly of themselves in most ways. They think, yeah, I'm okay. I'm a good person. There'll be a lot of good, good people in hell because they didn't get into a living, loving, active, Bible-based relationship with Jesus Christ. So be, being good doesn't cut it. And Jesus came into contact with a lot of people that were good, you know. but that was their own definition of good, wasn't it? And so we can't have that definition. We need to have a... Definition that goes beyond our opinion, our view, our background, what we're feeling, what we're thinking. It has to go beyond that. 
He just might say in doing that self-examination of the Holy Spirit, you're overlooking a couple of areas that could grow into real problems if they're not addressed right now. Paul referred to this uh, type of method in 2 Corinthians 10. We're going to read it again because that verse 12 is something else. He was saying that you can't compare yourself with yourself. So look at what it says. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they, measure, this is their mistake, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So don't look at yourself and think, well, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about myself, and that's enough. Or, you know, I, I think I'm all right. Well, you may think those things, and you may feel those things, but those still have to be substantiated by God's Word, just like they do for me or for you. You could say, yeah, I think I'm doing all right. Check it against the Word. Well, you know, I feel pretty good about that. Check it against the Word. You know, check it against other people. You know, Paul said that, follow me as I follow Christ. Uh, check it against other people that are around you that are Bible-believing followers of Jesus Christ, and you know that they are, you know, they're faithful in, in what they say and what they advocate, look at other lives and say, is, okay, this person is following Christ, does that have any similarity to, to what I say and what I'm, uh, how I'm living? Important questions. There has to be a norm outside of yourself that can give an accurate gauge of how you are doing. You know, when I counsel with people, I spend about 90% of the time trying to get them to look, look beyond their own nose. It's like you're assessing things by your own standard. And if I can get that, that tithe of attention, you know, the other 10%, that tithe of attention and say, you know, if you can spend just a moment really looking at things as objectively as you can through God's Word, through the Holy, Holy Spirit, if you can do that and... You know, people come in with a preconceived or set uh, uh, agenda of ideas. That's so why I spend a lot of my time convincing them. You know, you're looking at this the wrong way. You're approaching this from the, the wrong angle. God's Word supplies that type of examination, that objective uh, examination. But you have to sit still long enough to hear the results and in a busy, demanding world, that may not always be easy to do. You know, with the examinations going on, the MRI, don't move. It's not the time to run away. When the Holy Spirit is pointing things out to you, that's time to move closer. Because he's saying, he doesn't just point them out, he says, I'm going to help you cope with it. No, he's not going to help us cope with it. Who wants to cope with it? He's going to say, I'm going to cure you. You're going to be set free from this. Isn't that what it's all about? There are at least three primary areas that need to be examined at the granular level. If there's a problem, what you want to hear from your doctor is that it was caught in time. We've heard some testimony of that already. Caught in time or a person was healed or the diagnosis was wrong. You know, it's amazing that the doctors will not say, wow, you were healed. They'll say, oh, the diagnosis was wrong. Or there were other factors that came into play. And I had a doctor one time when I was healed of advanced heart disease, and he actually got upset with me because his diagnosis was wrong. I mean, the diagnosis was, we need to medevac you to Seattle right now. And when I came back a couple of weeks later and told him, I said, well, they didn't find anything. They said, my heart's in great shape. And he was actually upset that his... Uh, general, short-lived, short-sighted diagnosis was wrong. Was it caught in time? You know, with God, that's what you hear. We're, as long as we're breathing and as long as we're functioning in this life, he'll come alongside and he'll say, we got this in time. But you're going to have to do something about it right now, and I'm going to help you with this. We caught it in time so that the situation does not need to get worse. One of the areas that we need to look at at the granular, granular level is mergers and acquisitions. This is a big one, really big. What types of ideas have we tied ourselves to that are inconsistent with what God wants to do in our lives? What kind of ideas are we harboring that really have nothing to do? 
You know, usually when we're harboring ideas like that, there's also rationalizations that go along with it. Excuses. Uh, it doesn't really matter. That's not going Have you ever heard anybody say that God's not concerned about that? He is concerned about every single area of your life, jot and tittle, granular, however you want to say it. Everything in your life he's concerned about. And if there's something that's there, then that is becoming an irritant like a spiritual splinter, then he says, let's, let's get that out right now because it's going to become an issue if we don't. Our assumptions about what God will tolerate are often very, very, very wrong, which means we have wrong ideas about grace, mercy, long-suffering. We have wrong ideas about those things. Don't take any of those things to think that God is saying, oh, that's okay. I know you're, you, you're doing the best you can. Doing the best you can doesn't cut it. It doesn't for any of us. The Holy Spirit comes and he says, I want to help you do better than that. Because you're, when you do the best you can, you're doing it within the confines of your own limitations. You're doing it within your own power, and that won't get you very far. So mergers and acquisitions, what have we merged ourselves to? What have we acquired that doesn't really fit with what God wants to do in our lives? All those things make us settle for something less than what God has for us. Another factor, have we, have we bought into some goal that has nothing to do with what God wants? It's amazing how far people will go and how much they will invest of their time and effort without ever really checking with God. Is this what God wants you to do? I've shared this with you a, a time or two, but when we first came up to Alaska uh, many years ago, I was working for a, I had a fairly good job at a Christian radio station in Texas. And we thought, well, there was something that was kind of urging me. This is, there's got to be a little bit more to it than this. So I told my wife, I said, well, we had connections here. Her family was here. And I said, well, I'll send some audition tapes at the time. I'll send some audition tapes up there, and we'll see what happens. And so somebody actually came back. And we said, we'd like you to have, uh, have you come and work for us. And we took that as a, as a cue from God after prayer and consideration that that was something that we needed to do. And it, as it panned out over the years, it turned out to be very true. But it sure was rough the first year when we got up here. With two little boys and $600 in the hole when I got here. And I couldn't get our furniture out of storage because I didn't have the money. And... The job that I came up for fell through. Wasn't here when I got here. Does that mean I miss God's will? See, don't think that because you say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to do this, you know, we prayed about it, and then if you get the okay from God and you go forward and things don't work out just like you thought it did, then do that self-examination. But realize that it means that God has something better for you, and he did have something better for us, much better. But through all of that self-examination and through all of those difficult times, you know, I can tell uh, right now, just knowing some of you, that probably Brother Randy's uh, bout with uh, cancer didn't exactly turn out like he thought it would. It was a little bit different. Probably the same for Brother Tim, Sister Rebecca. Their situations uh, medically probably didn't turn out exactly like they thought it would. And I can guarantee you that both of them and probably uh, most of us here have prayed in a way that it didn't turn out that way. I mean, what were we praying for, Brother Randy and Brother Tim? Lord, heal them now. Right? Did anybody pray like that? I did. I know uh, family members did. Did it happen like that? Not precisely. Is he, has he healed them or is he healing them? Because healing, you know, you think about it in, uh, in the Greek is where we get the word therapy. It's a process sometimes. And you may have a process that God is walking you through right now, but that doesn't mean that he hasn't uh, answered your prayer or that he won't answer it uh, in full in the days ahead. But he's walking you through. And to trust God that way, in one sense, you're going to have to take a granular approach to him. And the only way that you can do that is through his word. That's why you can read it. I've lost count of how many times, you know, I do the yearly reading, how many times I've actually read through God's word. I, 
I don't know anymore. I was thinking about it the other day. How many times have I done this? And still, in going all the way through, the it's fresh and new every time. And that's taking that granular approach in the Holy Spirit. Maybe he's thinking, okay, now you're ready to receive this particular uh, passage. And then he brings it forth. But we have to be careful about what we merge ourselves to church-wise, idea-wise, friend-wise. We have to be careful about what we acquire and say, this is okay with God. Be very careful. Another area that needs to be checked is our spiritual market share. Right now you have uh, far more than you think. But you don't want any more, do you? Right. Don't answer. You have a whole lot more than what you think. But usually most of us say, are saying, I want more. Taking a granular approach means doing a true assessment on things as they stand right now. Right now. Not what you're striving for. And every little thing that we get, and you know this, whether it's a house, whether it's a car, whether it's clothes, whatever, what you're, you're not exchanging money for those things. You're exchanging your life. Because that's what the price is going to be as part of your life that you're going to have to dedicate to those things. Don't miss out on all the valuable components that God has put together on your behalf. Look for the opportunities, and when you do, in God, you find them. A third area that needs granular examina examination is our spiritual momentum. Our spiritual momentum. How are we doing? Are we progressing? Are we growing? Are we learning more about God? Are we taking those things and employing them in our lives? Everything that we find at the granular level has the potential to help us build momentum in the right direction. Everything. Whether it's what we're discovering through a friendship, a godly-based friendship, or what we're discovering in our daily study or prayer, or in ministry work, or how we reach to other people. I tell people in our uh, gun class, I said, try to learn something from everybody. Everybody that you come into contact with. Learn something from them. Talk to them. Learn how they approach life. Learn something from them and see how that fits, or if it doesn't fit, whatever. But always look to learn in every situation. You know, it really has uh, nothing to do with your background or your education or your spiritual maturity. If you want to learn something, you will. You will. I've been in some services and in uh, some Bible studies that uh, were highly questionable. Not here, but in other churches. I mean, you go to other churches and sometimes I'll sit, I'll, I'll sit through. I know it's strange, but uh, a lot of people say, well, when does the worship service begin? And uh, what I ask for is, when does Sunday school begin? And then I'm there for Sunday school because I need some instruction. It's amazing how many churches have stopped teaching uh, Sunday school. They've stopped holding a Sunday night service. They've stopped holding a Wednesday night service in direct violation of Hebrews 10.25. When it says, as we see the time approach, we assemble together more, not less. So what you need to do is find a church that started out with only one service. That way they're not meeting less, right? Wrong thinking, all right? The psalmist knew that even if wickedness was found at the granular level, God could set him back on the right path. That's in Psalm 139, 24. We read it. God expects us to be growth leaders. However, that can't be accomplished in a general fashion. You can't be somebody that leads in growth, as an example for others, in a general fashion. All of us grow differently. We all grow at different rates and in different ways. Our commonality is God's word. And so we have to allow that growth rate and ways for each other. One of my prayers is, Lord, help me grow faster. Lord, help me to absorb your word faster. I don't ask God to, well, God, you've got to understand that, you know, I, I'm busy and you've got to understand that I have some different concepts and some different ideas. That's, that's a waste of time. So what we do is we get into God's word and we say, Holy Spirit, show me what you want me to see. Help me to grow in what you reveal to me. That level of scrutiny is, is personal. That granular level is personal. It can only be done between God and you. Nobody else can really know it or know where you're at truly. 
Can you look at somebody and tell whether they're saved or not? Kind of. Does the Bible suggest that you do know them by their fruit? Okay, so in other words, uh, like looking at a tree, you can tell what a tree is. Well, I mean, I can't. My wife and Philip probably can, looking at a tree. But, I mean, I could probably distinguish maybe an apple tree from uh, the oranges growing trees. Yeah, okay. I could probably distinguish uh, between an apple and an orange tree. Am I judging that orange tree to be or an orange tree? Or is it simply what it is? It is what it is. No judgment needed. So can you tell if somebody is saved or not? That's kind of a tricky question. I would give a qualified yes, you can. And it usually, if you can, it usually reveals itself sooner or later as to whether they are or they aren't, usually sooner. 1 Corinthians uh, 11.28 suggests two facets to examination. You can look there if, uh, if you would like. It says, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So he's talking a little bit here, but what he's basically saying is testing and approving. Testing and approving. Two facets to examination, testing and approving. Ours is the first, God's is the second. We test ourselves, we invite the Holy Spirit into that process, and then he either approves or disapproves. And if he disapproves, then he leads us to a point of approval. So two points of examination, we can boil it all down to that, testing and approving, and it's what the Holy Spirit invites us to do right now. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for what you've done for us, how you looked at us in the particular. And with all of those rough edges, which is putting it very kindly, you still said, let's work on this together. This can be so much better for you if you'll make that commitment. No more excuses. Holy Spirit, I believe that what you would tell us to do right now is, if we want to make it better, for our family, for our friends, for our ministry, for our church. What you would say is, if you want those things, get serious about your walk with the living God. Because that helps all those other people. They may not fully appreciate it, but then we become a type of covering for them. And then we become an ambassador for God to them. And so if we're, if we're serious about that, then we need to take that granular approach and ask you to examine us in such a way and see if there's any way in me that is wicked or inappropriate, however we want to put it, and create in me a clean heart, as only you can do. You can do this. We can't. All those other things we talked about, holiness, sanctification, they're overwhelming. In this one sense, they're, they're your character traits, not ours. But then by your sacrifice and by your empowerment, you say, I'm going to give those to you. I'm going to empower you to employ that holiness, that sanctification, that consecration in your life. And so you help us by doing that close examination. Lord, help us to do this on a daily basis. You say, I think everything's all right. Everything's headed in the right direction. Holy Spirit, would you double check me on that? And you will. And we'll be stronger and better for it. And the people around us will be blessed because of it. Lord, thank you for each person here. I know that each person here has probably prayer, uh, uh, prayed a prayer a little bit like that. Lord, take a close look. See what needs to be addressed. Help me. You are the physician with a capital P. You're the physician who never misses, who always diagnoses perfectly every time and always issues the right prescription and the right prognosis every time. You've never missed. You know exactly what we need. You know what the problem is, and you know the path that needs to be followed. Lord, thank you for each person. Bless them as they have received from you in direct proportion. Lord, I just thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen and amen. May the Lord uh, bless each one of you as you've received. May each one of you go to